Hello, welcome once again to Stuff and Things, where I like to talk about stuff and occasionally even things. Just wanted to make sure that my mic was plugged in. I had another one of those little recording snafus where I was not actually recording audio. I'm your good friend Bradley, and today is a very, very pleasant Sunday Stuff and Things. We're going to talk about many stuffs and things in this episode, but I'm going to try to keep it a little bit more focused. We had some good response from the last episode, or at least a lot of response to the last episode, the last Sunday stuff and things, and I want to talk about some of that. But we will be going through, of course, a reading of Peter Straub's The Throat. We will be talking about a kind of feeling of, as spring is approaching in the world, a thaw seems to kind of be happening with this certain health crisis that we're all experiencing right now. I'm going to be talking about the Nomad products that I just reviewed, just recorded that review. That will be posting on Wednesday. We are going to talk, as I mentioned, about your response to my last Sunday Stuff and Things, where I was talking about classic rock and how I was having a little bit of a trouble, a little bit of trouble getting my head around uh, certain bands, certain very influential, very important bands from the late 60s, early 70s. And then, of course, we will have your questions and my answers in hashtag Ask Stuff and Things. But first, let us go along, go along and read from our good friend Peter Straub's The Throat. Peter is an award-winning author. He is a viewer of the Stuff and Things channel and a Patreon supporter at the Maniac tier, which means that I get to talk to him every once in a while, which is very cool. And he has given us permission to read from his book, The Throat. We've been doing it every week, and we will continue now. <clears throat> With chapter four, actually. Chapter four. When I emerged from the trance induced by Lee Lai's cigarettes, I found myself seated on the floor of the shed beside the desk, facing the open loading bay. De Maestro was standing in the middle of the room, staring with great concentration at nothing at all, like a cat. His right index finger was upraised, as if he were listening to a complicated bit of music. Pirate was seated against the opposite wall, holding another 100 in one hand and a dark brown drink in the other. Enjoy the trip. What's in there beside grass? My mouth was full of glue. Opium. Aha, I said. Any left? He inhaled and nodded towards the desk. I craned my neck and saw two long cigarettes lying loose between the typewriter and the bottle. I took them from the desk and put them in my shirt pocket. Pirate made a sound against his teeth with his tongue. I squinted into the sunlight on the other side of the bay and saw Picklock lying in the bed of the truck, either asleep or in a daze. He looked like an oversized dog. If you got too close, he would bristle and woof. De Maestro attended to his imperious music. Scoot was ranging back and forth over the body bags, humming to himself as he looked at the tags. Attica was gone. Ratman, at first glance, also missing, finally appeared as a pair of boots protruding from beneath the body of the truck. One of the bottles of Jack Daniels had disappeared, probably with Attica, and the other was three-fourths empty. I discovered the glass in my hand. All the ice had melted. I drank some of the warm, watery liquid, and it cut through the glue in my mouth. Who lives outside the camp? I asked. Where you were? That's inside the camp. But who are they? We have won their hearts and minds, Pirate said. Where do the kids come from? Benny's from heaven, Pirate said obscurely. De Maestro lowered his finger. I believe I'd accept another cocktail. There you are. Another reading from Peter Straub's The Throat. More next week, of course. Hopefully, ah, my pen is linking ink all over myself, or all over me, by the way. Uh, hopefully YouTube will not freak out about the drug references in there. It is literature, so relax a little bit, YouTube. All right, as I mentioned, um, we're going to be talking a little bit about the fact that in certain states, at least in the U.S., some of the restrictions imposed because of CV are kind of being lifted. For me personally, that means that I'm going back to work starting next week. Um, the party's over, gang. It's a good thing. We need to be working. Um, but I do have to admit, it's kind of hard to get my head around the fact that I'm going to be waking up at 5.30 every single morning and laboriously going about my day. Um, it's cool. I, I think maybe it'll be a good thing for me it always seems to help me to actually have a set schedule. It actually helps me get more done, even though I have less time. It's kind of weird. Just curious for all of you out there, are things at least slightly getting a little bit more towards normal? I just noticed here locally, 
there is a lot more traffic on the streets. There are a lot more people going about their business. There are still tons of people wearing masks. Um, it's really a mixed bag when you go out. Obviously, most retail stores are still closed here. The original uh, deadline in Washington was May 4th, I think, for the restrictions to be list lifted. I think that's been extended, kind of. Some things have been loosened, some things have still been extended. Um, but when you go to the grocery store, depending on which store you go to, I shop at Fred Meyer. It's a local-ish store here. I think they're in kind of Washington, Oregon, maybe even down into California a little bit. I love Fred Meyer, it's a great store. You go there, there aren't really any restrictions. A lot of people are wearing masks, but you can go in, you can shop, you can do your thing, it's fine. If you try to go to a place like Trader Joe's, for example, they make you line up outside. They have a very limited amount of customers who can be in the store at any one time. At Whole Foods, you are required to wear a mask if you go into the store. So it seems like there's kind of this striation based on class. The upper class people, or the people who are more, uh, I don't know, I don't, I don't want to base it on upper or lower class or whatever, but there is a certain type who might shop at Trader Joe's, and I'm not judging those people because like, I would shop there occasionally, my fiance shops there, but maybe a certain attitude towards this whole thing where people are still wearing masks, people are still very worried, and then you go to places like Fred Meyer, that's not really the case. I went to the hardware store today because I needed some new muck boots and some gloves and things. And it was business as usual. People didn't seem to be thinking anything of anything. And you can take that for what you will if you think that's a good thing or a bad thing. I'm not making any judgment on it. It's just something I have noticed. Um, and we're gonna be getting back to work in the construction field. There are going to be quite a few restrictions placed upon that, you know, like goggles, masks, hand wash stations, and all these things. But at least we're getting back to work, and I'm just curious where you are, what's the mood like, what's the tone like, how do things feel? It seems like a lot of people here, there's just kind of this unspoken thing where people are like, all right, enough is enough, we're just, we're just gonna start living our lives again. And again, whether that's good or bad, whatever, that's something I've been noticing, and I'm curious if you've been noticing that as well. Next, I just recorded my review of some Nomad products. Um, I mentioned these last week. I showed you, I guess, the boxes of the products that I was going to be reviewing. I had the iPhone 11 Pro case, which is on my phone right now, a really cool Horween leather case. Um, I also have, I just happen to have my iPod or my AirPods here, the AirPod case. Again, Horween leather. Nice and cool. I have the charging station. It's a wireless charging station, but I have that at home. I reviewed all three of these products. Um, a little preview. I liked them all. I liked the value, especially of these two. The wireless charging stand, mm, I liked as well, but it may or may not be a little too expensive. But you'll have to watch the review to see my full thoughts on that. But all of these are, I was really impressed by the quality of all of these and the materials that they're made out of. I have no misgivings or no qualms about that at all. And uh, yeah, I think you should check them out. If you like leather products and you like kind of tech gadgets, accessories, things like that, you should check out the reviews. They will be posting on Wednesday. And again, like I mentioned last week, I actually reached out to Nomad asking to do a review of a particular product, which they actually didn't send me, but I reached out to them and I don't typically do that. Usually it's companies reaching out to me and asking me if I want to review a product. I often say no, sometimes I say yes, but in this case, I reached out to them. So take that for what you will. Okay, <laughs> now for I guess what we could call the main topic of this episode of Sunday Stuff and Things. Last week, I knew I was going to be stepping into a minefield. I knew I was gonna be opening Pandora's box, a big kettle of fish, all those euphemisms or metaphors or whatever you wanna call them, when I said that I was having trouble getting into Pink Floyd, Led Zeppelin, Led Zeppelin, a lot of classic rock. And there's this, this little journey I've been going on recently where I, I wouldn't say I'm a student of music history or anything like that, but I definitely like knowing not just, oh, I like this song or I like this band, but I like to know where that song, where that band fits into 
the tapestry of music and how one thing leads to another and how uh, artists will build on things that people have done in the past. I like seeing that through line. I think it's cool. So I knew that for me, the late 60s, like very late 60s, turning into the early 70s was kind of a blind spot for me where I hadn't listened to a lot of those really seminal, really famous bands. And so I was trying to rectify that. That's kind of where we started with the whole discussion. Mm. Got a little Peterson nightcap, by the way, in my Dunhill 1962 Root Briar Saddle Bit Billiard. So I had been trying to get into Pink Floyd. It was a band that I said I had always heard of, obviously, they're very famous, um, but had never really given a chance and had never really gotten into them when I had heard them. And then Led Zeppelin as well. You can't help but have heard Led, Led Zeppelin songs, and I had never really loved anything that I had heard. But since that video, um, I want to say I have never, I've never been ignorant to how important both of those bands are. And when I say that I'm not able to get into something, it doesn't necessarily mean, or it definitely doesn't mean that I don't appreciate their place in history. And there's a difference between liking something and appreciating something. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. Um, just a little update on the Led Zeppelin front. I got uh, Led Zeppelin 2, Led Zeppelin 3, and Led Zeppelin 4. And I've been listening to those three albums. And I have to say, I actually like Led Zeppelin 2. Not every song, not everything is a win, and not every song that I do like is, you know, perfect from start to finish. But I enjoy that album. And I wasn't sure that I was going to. I'm not really a huge fan of like the plant bombastic kind of sort of soulful vocals um, and I guess it's just sort of a a style of rock like very bombastic kind of showy or at least that's what it seemed to me looking from the outside in it just wasn't really my aesthetic or my my taste or my tone I guess but I have to admit Led Zeppelin 2 I like a lot I like Ramble On a lot um, you know, there are a, a lot of good hits on that album. It's good. It's a good album. I, I did raise an eyebrow a bit when Robert Plant started making Lord of the Rings references, but that's fine. Um, and then Led Zeppelin 3, there are songs on 3 and 4 that I enjoy and that I appreciate. And then with Pink Floyd, I still have not really sat down and tried to listen to Dark Side of the Moon or The Wall from like track 1 to the end. Uh, I did get uh, Wish You Were Here, and I, I still just don't really like it that much. I love the song Wish You Were Here. I think that's a great song, but the whole album as a concept, as an entire piece, I'm just not really into. Sorry, can't help it. But again, I just want to reiterate, it's fascinating to me what they are in terms of their place in music history, same with Led Zeppelin. And that stuff is still fascinating to me. Like I have watched a couple documentaries about, you know, the making of Wish You Were Here. I watched a documentary about, um, I had listened to Pink Floyd in the Sid Barrett era, uh, Piper at the Gates of Dawn, and then Saucer Full of Secrets, he was kind of partially on that era. And I'd always enjoyed that, but it wasn't something I was super into, never super into psychedelic stuff. Uh, John's Children, like stuff like that. I, I have a, a good background of music history, especially British music. But um, just knowing, I guess when I was talking before about enjoying seeing the through line of where bands came from and bands that preceded them and sort of where they all place in this continuum of popular music, it's fascinating to me the change from the late 60s into the early 70s and how drastic a change it was. And even from like the mid 60s to the late 60s. And that's what's fascinating to me about these bands especially. Especially like Led Zeppelin or Black Sabbath even. I'm not a metal fan. I don't like metal music at all. But the first Black Sabbath album, Paranoid, isn't really what I would call metal. Maybe it's kind of proto-metal. But that album is is so hard and for it to come was that 69 or 70 i can't remember but right around that era and when you think about what the beatles were doing and and even the beatles 
evolved and advanced considerably. But if you go from like 1965 to 1970 in a five year period, you have, you know, the Beatles doing R R Rubber Soul and then you have Robert Plant having like a simulated orgasm while singing Whole Lotta Love. Like, how did things happen that quickly? How did things change that quickly? That's what I find so fascinating. And that's what I really appreciate about this from sort of a music history perspective. Some of the music I really like, some of it I don't like very much, but I, I am kind of in awe of the fact that it was produced and I do appreciate the fact that it was produced. And I don't know, I was listening, I was actually watching a YouTube video that showed a performance Black Sabbath in, I can't remember if it was 69 or 70, in Brussels, I think, or in Belgium anyway. And it's crazy. Like, th that was on stage at that time, so close to, you know, like, think of all those British invas invasion bands and stuff. And it was just so diametrically different to what had come before. And I can only imagine what it would have been like to be alive during that time and be into music. You know, now a band releases an album every five years, it seems like, and there may be some evolution, there may be some change, but it doesn't happen that quickly. And usually if you like the band's last album, you're probably gonna like the next one. And when you think about how many albums those bands put out in such a short amount of time and how drastically they change throughout that time, it's crazy. If you just look at the Beatles, you know, from with the Beatles and Please Please Me and everything, going to the White Album and Abbey Road and Let It Be, like such a, a gulf of difference. It's so crazy how much they changed. And then to have stuff that's so hard after that, the, the Led Zeppelin stuff, some of the Pink Floyd stuff, the, the Black Sabbath stuff, uh, I don't know. It's just, it's fascinating to me. I find the whole thing very fascinating. And as I said, I can appreciate all of it I'm learning to like some of it. I really like some of it as well. And uh, I don't know, it's been fun. It's kind of been tying into my whole reconnecting with guitar thing as well, where I'm trying to learn some songs and experimenting, trying to broaden my musical horizons a little bit. Uh, I learned how to play Wish You Were Here. That's not a hard song to learn, I guess, but uh, I don't know, it's been really fun. And it's been fun to read your comments and your I guess, reaction to the, to the video I did last week. I knew that a lot of people would be quite irritated when I said that I wasn't a huge fan of Pink Floyd, but I understand why you like it. It just doesn't mean that I'm going to like it for the same reasons. Alrighty, hopefully I didn't lose too many of you there with that extended musical rant, because now it is time for hashtag ask stuff and things. Remember, if you have a question for me and you would like it answered on the Sunday Stuff and Things tweet, at SAT Bradley with the hashtag Ask Stuff and Things, and I will do my best to answer you on the next Sunday Stuff and Things. Also, if you are a Patreon supporter, you can write to me there. First, via Patreon from Dr. Dre. Hello, Dr. Dre. Dr. Dre says, <clears throat> and he requests the Bradley voice, as far as guitar playing goes, were you always self-taught or did you ever take lessons? I started playing at 15 myself, recently started taking lessons with a good teacher at classical guitar, and admittedly results are night and day in terms of quality of play. It's amazing how many bad habits one develops if they're not careful. As far as Pink Floyd goes, I would recommend Dark Side of the Moon. None of the songs are ridiculously long, and saxophone is only in two of the songs. I will say it is a concept album, I hate saxophone in pop songs, or in rock or whatever. Uh, where the songs are meant to fit together as jigsaw pieces. Pink Floyd is not for everyone, though. I'm glad to hear you also like Radiohead. Thanks. Uh, I love Radiohead. Uh, being self-taught, yes. I am only self-taught in guitar and poorly self-taught, I would say, in guitar. Like I said, I started learning when I was 15. I started learning just like power chords, stuff like that. Was never taught proper... Uh, I guess proper mechanics, music theory, any of that stuff. I picked some of that stuff up over the years and again have never really buckled down as hard as I need to to really get good. Um, I happen to be in a, a phase in which I'm super into guitar again. Hopefully I can 
ride this for a while. I, I have this horrible tendency of getting really, really into something for a while. It goes in cycles, then I won't do much of it for months on end, then I'll get really into it again. I would like to kind of flatten that curve out a little bit and just be into something a moderate amount all the time. And I'm hoping to do that with guitar, and I'm hoping to really put the work in and actually see a lot of improvement. And to that end, I've been actually trying to do like finger exercises and things like that. Um, but you're right, you do pick up a lot of bad habits when you're self-taught. If you don't have a nice foundation from someone who knows what they're doing, and it's hard to reverse those things. So we'll see. I'll keep you guys updated. Next, from Twitter, Julian Olson says, or at Julian O12556862, hey. Have you tried using a corncob pipe much? I have heard it has a drier and cooler smoke, similar to a meerschaum due to its porous nature. We'll be curious to hear your thoughts. To hear your thoughts? Hear your thoughts. Um, we've addressed this before on the channel. I get some flack, forget about me being kind of down on Pink Floyd. The fact that I'm kind of down on corncob pipes gets me a lot of flack. And ah, I'm sorry, they're fine, they're okay, but I, there's not really any circumstance where I prefer a corncob to a briar. Um, I think they're fine. And for the price, they're great, actually. But I just aesthetically don't like them that much. Um, from just like a pure mechanic, Point. They're fine. I don't like the way the the stem is inserted into the bowl on most of them. I don't love how that works. I they're okay. Like use what you want. It's gonna be fine. I know I'm not I'm not yelling at you, Julian. I know this is just an innocent question. Um, but some people get so upset, or they think that you're being very elitist if you don't like a corn cob pipe. Um, I think they're fine. I just never reach for one over a briar pipe. That's just me. Next, from Nicholas Amato at Viper NPA. Hey Bradley, I was wondering what knife you use for plugs and ropes. I'm looking to get an EDC knife that would serve that purpose. Purpose? Thanks. Um, I use this knife right here. This is an SE4. Uh, no, I don't use this knife. I don't know why I have this knife with me right now. Uh, but I like it. I have, I've never used it really for anything. I like to look at it. I like to hold it. I like how it feels in my hand. I don't know why I bought this, but I did, and I like it a lot. Um, the knife that I would use most often for cutting a plug is whatever knife I happen to have on me right now. Ugh, I've got my Leatherman Skeletool, and it has a little knife blade on here, and it works just fine. Uh, sometimes I'll have a pocket knife, like a traditional slip point, slip joint. Um, you've seen very early on on this channel, I reviewed some of those, a case, uh, some GEC knives. So whatever I happen to have on me works just fine. Next, from Robert G. Evans, and, and I highly recommend the Leatherman Skeletool. I love that thing. Robert G. Evans at Drawn Cutlass asks, Ever tried you and Rees tobaccos? Most seem to be aromatics, but there are a few non-aromatics as well. I have not. Um, I'm almost remembering, maybe almost ordering some. I know I've had people recommend several different blends from them before, and ooh, I want to say I may even have a tin somewhere of something. But I will look into that, Robert. Thank you for the question. Next, from Turf Smurf at B.S. Smurf at B. Smurf 1974. Hi, Bradley. So decided to get Breath of the Wild, and it is as amazing as I thought. Did you know you can play it in VR? Seeing Hyrule like that is just awesome. So much fun. I had heard Breath of the Wild, obviously, a launch game for the Nintendo Switch. Amazing, seminal, generational game. Beautiful. You should play it. Uh, I did a Let's Play of it on the channel, by the way. Very long. Very good. You should watch it. Uh, not this channel, Stuff That Explains. Anyway, um, I had heard that it was available in VR. I had also heard that it wasn't great in VR, but this is just, you know, secondhand. I haven't actually tried it myself. I would think that the resolution of the Switch is such that, and I'm assuming you're using like the Labo VR device that Nintendo put out. Um, I would think that the resolution, 720p on the screen of the Switch would be pretty low 
having it that close to your eyes. I don't know. I've never actually used a real VR thing. The only VR stuff I've done is like that Google Cardboard with your phone. And even that looked pretty meh. And that's with a really, like this is a high resolution display, but it wasn't fantastic. Um, so I don't know. I'm curious. I'd be curious to see that and see how it looks. I know just the art style and everything about that world is beautiful in that game. So I don't know. Maybe it's good if we trust uh, uh, Turf Smurf. And I think I do. I think Turf Smurf's a, trusting guy, a, a, a trustworthy guy. So I'd like to check that out. Last, from Tyler, at Tyler Brubaker 20. Hi, Bradley. Hope all is well. In your opinion, what are some really, really underrated bands? <coughs> Hashtag ask stuff and things. Underrated. There's one band that comes to mind probably more than any other when someone mentions underrated, and that is The Cribs. They are from Wakefield in the UK, though I believe maybe they're all living in the US now. I know at least one of them lives in Portland, or did live in Portland. They are fantastic. If you like, what would I even call it? British, post-punky kind of, but they're current. They first emerged in like the early 2000s along with like kind of a little bit after the Libertines and bands like that. Um, very indie, very guitar driven. They're, they're three brothers basically, two twins and their younger brother on drums. I think they are fantastic. They're one of my favorite bands of the last uh, 15 years, I guess. And it has been a shame whenever I've seen them play, I've seen them several times. Uh, once I saw them in Seattle and the venue was like half full, they're pretty well known in the UK, I think, at least amongst like indie bands. I think they play like festivals and big shows in the UK, but in the US, it doesn't seem like they can draw a crowd and I think they should because I think they're fantastic. So check out The Cribs. All right, gang, that was hashtag ask stuff and things, but now it is time for the very best part of the show. And that is where I thank you, my Patreon supporters, by giving you a special shout out. If you are a Patreon supporter at the 25 and up level, you get a special shout out every week on the Sunday Stuff and Things. We appreciate you so much and cannot thank you enough. So now a special shout out to our good friends, AJ Hogue, Ryan McFadden, MD of the North, Kirk Crompton, Private Eye, Cody Striegler, Ryan Stoffer, Corbin Borbin and Glenn, uh, just Glenn. And now the maniac tier, the crazy people who support the channels at $100 a month. People like Peter Straub, our good, good, dear, wonderful friend, and Bob McGee, stolid, dependable, trustworthy, Bob McGee. Thank you all so much for your support. It is much appreciated. And thank you all so much for your support watching commenting, liking, sharing, all that good stuff, sending your questions in to hashtag AskStuffAndThings on Twitter. It's really very much appreciated. I enjoy the dialogue that we guys, that we guys, that we get to share, that I get to share with you guys, something like that. Uh, keep those questions coming. I will keep you updated on guitar stuff. That happens to be my kick right now. Hopefully you guys are into that too. Uh, maybe we'll talk a little bit more about classic rock. I'll give you maybe an update if I've listened to more bands, listened to more albums. We have the Nomad product review coming up on Wednesday. Please watch that. I think they're nice things and you might like them. Also on Stuff and Things Plays, we are continuing with Outer Wilds, the game that keeps on giving every Monday and Friday. And then on Wednesdays, we're having our Animal Crossing New Horizons check-ins, still playing that quite religiously with my fiance. Eventually we'll be getting to new series, new games, but that's in the future. Until next time, until we meet again, I've been your good friend Bradley. You've been the audience. This has been Stuff and Things on a pleasant Sunday Stuff and Things. I'll see you later. <laughs>